Genesis chapter 29. Then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the Eastern peoples. There he saw there he saw a well in the open country with three flocks. Oh, with three flocks of sheep lying near it because the flocks were watered from that well. The stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the, of the well. Jacob asked the shepherds, My brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran. They replied. He said to them, Do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him. They answered. Is he well? Then Jacob asked them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is, Is he, he well? well? Yeah, uh, yes, he is. They said, and here comes his daughter. Oh, they said. <laughs> <laughs> we rehearsed this. Uh, and, and here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. Look. He said. The sun is still high. It is not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and take them back to pasture. We can't. They replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking to them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter, Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then Laban kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah. So she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he turned to meet him. He hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all these things. Then Laban said to him, You are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder one was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel has a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, J Give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zipla to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also, in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him, as, gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. 
She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. It's not just about the love between Jacob and Rachel, but it is there, isn't it? The Bible does acknowledge and celebrate this kind of love, this romantic love. It is, in fact, one of several kinds of love. It's a wonderful book called The Four Loves. Um, written many years ago, very helpful. Uh, three of them are natural and one is supernatural. Four loves in the world. One is family love or affection. Another is friendship. Friendship, love, if you like. Uh, David spoke about that before Christmas. Uh, another is uh, romantic love, as we see here. Family love, friendship love, romantic love. And then over and above them all is that great love of God that uh, agape in the New Testament, that unconditional and free and forgiving love, that grace. All of them are gifts of God. Friendship, family, romance, and the wonderful love that we see in Christ. They're all gifts of God. But those natural loves, the ones we're calling natural loves, the family love, the family affection, the friendship, and the romance, <clears throat> desperately need the love of God behind them and underneath them and, and throughout them to keep them from becoming selfish and destructive. These other loves very quickly uh, become corrupted. They, uh, they can devour one another, if you like, um, romantically, even in friendship or in families. Things can go quickly wrong without the love of God. Now, we see all of these loves in the Bible. We see the family love or family affection. Think of Abraham's love for his son Isaac. My, my son, my, my, my only son. He, he speaks of him so warmly, doesn't he? In, in Genesis uh, 22, for example. Uh, we see friendship love. In many parts of the Bible. David and Jonathan, that wonderful friendship, that loyal covenant friendship they had with each other um, that is described as, as greater than love that they might have had for a woman. Now, it wasn't sexual in any aspect, but it was a great friendship. Even an intimate friendship without being sexual. And Jesus himself, in his humanity, certainly with, with, uh, with Peter, James, and John, had special friendships, didn't he, with them? Especially with John, who was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then outside of that group of, of the apostles, with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he loved to go to their home in Bethany uh, and to be with them and to eat with them. Great friends of his. Friendship love, family love, romantic love, and then the wonderful love of God to fill them all. And here we have romantic love, very clearly, don't we, between Jacob and Rachel. Here it is in the Bible. Romantic love is a thing, isn't it? It's part of the human experience. We're created, we're designed, we're made for, um, for romantic love. All of us have probably been through it. We've felt it. It can be a great blessing. It can also be very complicated, as we see here in Genesis 29, very messy. But it is celebrated in the Bible in its goodness. God recognizes, God gave it. He recognizes the goodness of romantic love. There's a whole book in the Bible devoted to it. It's called Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. It's just after the Psalms. It's a whole book. I mean, it's not a huge book. It's eight chapters long. But it is really about human romantic love. A pure love. It's a love song, really. Now, of course, um, romantic love, like every other love, like every other relationship, is messed up by human sin and selfishness, as we so well know. But here in chapter 29, Jacob falls in love, doesn't he? We're told that in verse 18. 
Jacob was in love with Rachel. He fell in love with her. We don't know if it was love at first sight. Um, it was a good first meeting, wasn't it, in those early verses. Uh, he, he, uh, he impressed her, I think, with his care and help. Um, but uh, he is certainly in love with her by verse 18. And so much so that he offers uh, Uncle Laban, her father, he offers to work for seven years uh, for her hand in marriage. To receive her hand in marriage, he will work for seven long years, which I understand is about twice the going rate um, at that time. Uh, three to four years would have been uh, normal. Uh, or expected around that time. I think we can say with confidence that J Jacob was, was head over heels in love with this girl, besotted, hooked, whatever word you want to use. He offers seven years instead of three or four. One joke is, uh, what's, what's that funny feeling you get when you fall in love? Answer, that's common sense leaving your body. Maybe that was Jacob here. Maybe he sort of lost his mind over this girl. But he really wants her, doesn't he? So he takes no chances and he offers seven years of hard labor. Of course, Uncle Laban, he's a crafty old fellow, isn't he? He's craftier, I think, than Jacob in many ways. He, he agrees to this. It's a very good deal for him. Seven years of free, free work. But we're told for Jacob, the years seem to fly past because of his love for her. Oh, how romantic. There it is in verse 20. Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. A bit of a schmaltzy moment in the Bible, that isn't it? We don't get many of them, but there it is. Very romantic. The Bible affirms the goodness of romantic love. Now, some of you are at that stage and age, perhaps, where, or it uh, doesn't have to be a stage and age, but you may be thinking about these things, love and marriage and romance and so on. And uh, I know you don't want me to be your agony aunt or your agony uncle. That's perfectly fair. I couldn't do that anyway. But what about the wisdom that we find in God's Word? The wisdom from God Himself. Well, recently I've tried to point you to, to the Bible, to 1 Corinthians 7 in particular, to help you with this. If you're thinking about this, if you're at that age and stage where you are thinking about romantic love, about relationships, about dating, about marriage, and so on, I think the best thing for you to do is to go to God's Word to get your guidelines, your framework, it's tremendous freedom within that framework, but you need the framework. And not just to rely on your feelings or impressions for guidance. Because feelings of this kind can be particularly powerful. When you're falling in love, when you feel like you're in love, it's a very powerful emotion, isn't it? Uh, and to be making decisions then is, uh, well, it's, you can easily get carried away, can't you? We were in love. And you can do anything. Get back to the solid, solid ground of God's wise word. And, and do so, especially, I think, before the feelings come and sweep you along. Before the attraction, before the desire. Go to God's word and get grounded in his wisdom. Because um, the Bible has wisdom for married people and single people. First of all, let me just remind you of a few things. Drawing largely from 1 Corinthians 7, just because it's been raised in Genesis 29. Um, if you're a Christian, you are required to marry a Christian. And therefore to date a Christian before you get married. You are required to marry a Christian. Uh, it's in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, marry in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7 also points out the value of singleness. It's a good option. It might even be a better option if you can handle it, if you can manage it. 
if you have the gift of singleness or the self-control to some extent to resist the sexual temptations around you and remain single, celibate. Churches have not always been very good at this. They've often tried to push people into marriage. You know, you get people, sometimes you get folks in the church who are matchmakers. <laughs> Someone walks in, a young man or a woman walks in, and they immediately think, oh, that they would go well with that other person. That, that's really helpful. <laughs> because singleness is a good option, according to the Bible. Families, too, and certain cultures can put tremendous pressure on, on their children to get married could push people in that direction. And that's not really required Christianly. Not according to the Bible. There should be a freedom to marry or not to marry. 1 Corinthians 7. There is a tremendous freedom, I think, for Christians in this respect. But they must marry someone of the opposite sex and they must marry a Christian in the Lord. But beyond that, it's wide open. And I know, I know it's the always easy because particularly in a small church there aren't many sort of candidates maybe you have to look beyond the, the bounds of the small church to other Christian gatherings but there's tremendous wisdom in 1 Corinthians 7 and tremendous freedom we're told that we should be uh, or you should be aware of your sexual desires of the strength of your sexual desires if you feel as a single person that you are burning with passion then you probably need to get married in order to protect you from sexual temptation and immorality. Marriage is given on one level to satisfy those desires so that you do not fall into sexual immorality, whether that's in Corinth in the first century or London in the 21st century. But it may be that you, you do not really need to marry and you are able, therefore, to devote more time and energy to serving the Lord. Most of us, I think, probably do need to marry, but there are a number of Christians, there are some tremendously effective Christians who have stayed single and celibate, that's what singleness means in the Bible, uh, and been able to serve the Lord with great focus. 1 Corinthians 7 speaks about focus, and serving the Lord, and even being free from the concerns of a married person. I, I do want to say, I think, that I know that with single, singleness, I hope I'm not saying this glibly as a married person, but I know that some people, of course, struggle very much with being single, and some people struggle very much with being married also, of course, but there is a great sense, I think, for single people that they are missing out. They are missing out on that companionship and that sexual experience that, that, that married people have. They're missing out on not having children. These things can be, can be great tr difficulties for some people. I appreciate that. But I think the Bible is so positive about singleness that I want to say to you that even if you feel you're missing out in, in this life, that you will not miss out in eternity. If, for the sake of Christ, you choose the single life. When singleness is for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, to use the words of Jesus in Matthew 19, it can be a tremendously powerful thing. And you will not miss out in eternity. It's not that you'll get to eternity, you'll get to heaven, and you'll feel like, well, now I don't have my family around me, and, and, uh, and so on. That won't be the case. The Lord will bless you and reward you. However, the Bible is also very positive about marriage. It's good to be married, it says. It's good to be single. It's good to be married. It'd be different for some of us. You might look at Genesis 29 and think this is not a great advert for marriage, especially not to, to more than one uh, person, which, of course, the Bible does not uh, promote one man, one woman is what it promotes. That's the ideal. But there are some beautiful pictures in other parts of the Bible of marriage. In the Song of Songs, for example, 
in Ephesians chapter 5, where it's compared to the relationship between Christ and his church. Both of these are good. Uh, so I urge you really to use the Bible to guide you in this decision-making, not to rely on your feelings or impressions or even random Bible verses. It's been known for Christians to use the Bible in a kind of a bingo way or a random way just to open up to some passage, to rip it out of context and say, oh, the Lord's speaking to me here about my relationship. Um, might not have anything to do with the relationship. So be really careful with that, please. Um, I once heard of one fellow, I may have told you before, he was thinking about he thought the Lord was sending him overseas. He didn't know where he was going to go. As a missionary, he walked into a shop. The first thing he saw was Brazil nuts. The Lord's telling me to go to Brazil. <laughs> That's very dodgy as guidance. As uh, someone has said, it's lucky he did the first thing he, he, he saw. It's lucky that the first thing he didn't see was a Mars bar. How would that have worked? <laughs> I mean, <trick. laughs> All those unbelievers in Mars. Please also notice, no, I want to show you one more thing before we go there. I want to show you too that, um, of course, in this story, Jacob, and uh, the, still in the love story part of this, Jacob waited seven years to marry Rachel and to have sex with her. No question uh, that he hooked up with her before they were married. He didn't. He waited seven years to marry her and then have sex with her. And that's the Bible way, isn't it? That's God's way. It's always been God's way. It hasn't changed. And more than ever, I think we need to make that clear, because I think a lot of Christians are now confused, and they wonder whether it really matters. Does it matter to have sex outside marriage? Yes, it still does. God calls us as Christians, as children of God, to a holy life, a pure life. Sexual purity means keeping sex within marriage. It's where it belongs. It's where it works best. It's where the maker himself has told us to keep it. In 1 Thessalonians 4, listen to these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 8. It is God's will that you should be holy, that you should be sanctified. Now, Christian life is not just about loving each other as, as well as we can. It is but it's also about living a holy life. In fact, it's holy love. It's God's will that you should be sanctified or holy. And then it goes on to define that. This is not the whole of holiness, but it is a key part of it. That you should avoid sexual immorality. Each of you, um, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. But you do know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister by having sex with them outside the secure commitment of marriage. And it says very solemnly, the Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, to but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject the human being, but God. The very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. He grieves his Spirit. Now, th these are solemn words, but there is forgiveness, of course. There is forgiveness. We've, we've sinned, haven't we? All of us. And there is, there is help from the Holy Spirit to fight these temptations to resist, to live that holy life, to pursue holiness. The Bible says, pursue holiness, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Let me impress upon you this morning the importance of holiness for Christians. We are called to live a holy life. Let's be serious about it. Holiness is a requirement for Christians, and that means avoiding Sexual immorality. And God himself is committed to making us holy. So as we look into the Bible story further in Genesis 29, we see this principle from the Bible uh, cropping up so, so clearly. 
It's also a principle of life. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. We see this, don't we, as Jacob gets a taste of his own medicine from Uncle Laban. The, the great duper, the great deceiver, Jacob, now gets duped and deceived by his Uncle Laban. He's a crafty fellow, isn't he? He is tricked into marrying the wrong sister. In the morning, it was Leah, not Rachel, in the bed with him. And then sneaky Uncle Laban gets another seven years' labor out of Jacob. He does allow, the one concession he makes, he allows Jacob to marry uh, before doing the extra seven. You marry Rachel, uh, but he does get another seven years out of him. Jacob has been duped just as he has duped his own father and brother just recently. And now he feels the pain that Esau had felt and Isaac had felt, particularly Esau. God was teaching Jacob a lesson. Sometimes we all need this lesson. One writer puts it this way. Perhaps, as it was for Jacob, there are difficult people in our lives. Like Laban, harsh people, judgmental people, deceitful people, untruthful people, arrogant people. And we cry for, for relief. We, we pray for help. We may, maybe we pray for the Lord to take them out of our lives. But it just may be, says this writer, that through them we take a long look at ourselves. It may be that some of those sins characterize us. And that other people may be part of God's means of disciplining us and changing us. Bringing these people into our lives that we wish weren't there. But it shows us something about ourselves. Take a long look at yourself. Now wait, is that me? Is, do I see myself in that character? Perhaps for some, uh, imagine a Christian with a loose tongue who gossips a little too much. Along comes someone who gossips about him or her. Now the boot's on the other foot. Now they feel the pain of being gossiped about. Remember, God is always working for our good in all things. Good and bad, happy and sad, making us holy. So it's good for you, and perhaps you can do this right now, to think about the people God has put in your lives, particularly those you'd rather were not in your life. Are they teaching you some lesson? Or is God teaching you something through them? Disciplining you and teaching you about your own character. I think there's also a very clear reminder here that life is disappointing. I'm sure you've found that. Jacob was, to say the least, disappointed. He was devastated, wasn't he? He woke up in the morning... He's worked seven years for Rachel, and it was Leah, not Rachel. The wrong sister was in the bed. In the morning, it was Leah. Romantic love and marriage is not the be-all and end-all. That's what the movies say. They say that uh, your happiness depends on romance, love. That will fulfill you. That will make you happy ever after. Well, it's not that way, is it? Tim Keller, the New York preacher, has said, it's always Leah in the morning. <laughs> in the cold light of day. It's disappointing, isn't it? Life is disappointing. I'm not saying it's always disappointing and it's always horrible, but there's plenty of moments where we've really put our hopes in something, a relationship, a marriage, a job, even a church. But it's not long before we're disappointed. Now this doesn't mean we have to leave the marriage or leave the job or leave the church. Please don't. You will be disappointed with us, by the way. Uh, we persevere. You carry on. You don't give up. But it does mean you don't seek your ultimate happiness. Your fulfillment, your ultimate security from a marriage, 
a relationship, a job, a game, whatever, entertainment, you won't find it there. It will be disappointing. And we need disappointment. We actually need disappointment. God is gracious to allow us to be disappointed, as painful as it is. Or we would not rely on him. We would, we would make that our God, wouldn't we? If we found something that made us truly happy and fulfilled us to the max, we would say, this is, this is all I need. The marriage cannot be perfect. The flat, the job, the house, the car, the whatever that you put your hope in, the dreams coming true. No, God does not exist to make our dreams come true. Please, please, please don't believe that. His dreams for us are much, much bigger than the dreams we have for ourselves. We will be disappointed. Jacob was disappointed. But the promise is, the great promise is that God works in all our disappointments for our good. And in fact, he means our disappointments for our good. Genesis 50, 20. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He means it for our good. And then ultimately in glory, as he carries us there through all these disappointments and difficulties, as well as the happy days as well, yes, of course, there will be no more disappointment, no more tears. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. But the way to that perfect world <coughs> is through disappointments. Now, we have to have them. We have to feel disillusionment. We have to feel disappointment, dissatisfaction, especially when we, you know, when we really invest ourselves too much in something, be it a sport or a game. As a, as a kid, I was very into to sports, football, golf, um, and I put far too much of my expectation, and I was disappointed. I was heartbroken. I, I, missed, I missed a putt once in, in, in golf, and I, I spent the whole afternoon uh, devastated. I was hacking into our plum tree in the garden with my, with my golf club, like this, just hacking away. I was so upset that I'd missed and lost this game. Because it was my God at that moment. I was so disappointed. But one day we will thank the Lord for all our disappointments. In fact, the Lord says, you can start now. <laughs> you can start thanking him. Rejoice in all. Count it, consider it pure joy, says uh, James, whenever you uh, face trials of many kinds, trials and disappointments. Well, we need disappointment, but I want to encourage you uh, to look out for the Lord's love in all the disappointment and and all the mess, because it's here, isn't it, at the end of this chapter. The great thing here is that the Lord has the last word. It's not Laban who has the last word, or crafty, crafty Laban, or crafty Jacob, or anyone else. But the Lord steps in now, doesn't he? In verse 31, he's been there the whole time, of course, and now he's been watching, and now he goes to work. And he blesses the underdog, doesn't he? Rachel, we, we love that in sport, don't we? Or in any, almost anything, when, when the, the underdog wins, or gets one over on the, on, the, on the other, on the overdog. Is there an overdog? But she's the unloved one, isn't she? Leah is unloved. Rachel is loved, but Leah is unloved. And each time Leah gives birth, she hopes against hope that somehow she will make her husband love her. It's a sad, sad situation, isn't it? But no, no, that's not the case. This is a soap opera, isn't it, really? Uh, she, even after her second child, as you can see there, um, Reuben, it is because she, she calls them Reuben for, for a reason, it's a meaning. He has seen my misery. It is because, she says, the Lord has seen my misery Verse 32, surely my husband will love me now. What a sad thing to say. It's obvious that he doesn't. He loves Rachel so much more, at least. But finally, she reaches a point, doesn't she, where, where she praises the Lord anyway. He, the Lord gives her an, an, another child. And she calls him Judah. It's there in verse 35. 
And uh, the, word, the, the word Judah means praise. And that's what she does. She praises the Lord. Now he, she recognizes the Lord's goodness to her. Now it's just another baby, no different from the rest in a sense. But it's as if she's woken up to the reality that God is being good to her. God is blessing her with all of his children. She felt she had to earn Jacob's love. I hope you're not in a relationship or a marriage where you have to earn your partner's love. God's love came freely into her life. He loved her freely. Jacob didn't love her, but the Lord did. And it seems like eventually she came to realize, she came to recognize that that the Lord loved her. And she praised the Lord for his kindness. She seems to have found some contentment, doesn't she? Rachel is not content. You look at the beginning of the next chapter. She, she is so jealous and angry, she says to Jacob, we're not there yet, I know, but next week, give me children or I'll die. She's very unhappy. She's the pretty one, remember. She's got the advantage, but actually, the tables have been turned a little bit. And it's Leah who is content. It's Leah who is praising the Lord. Now, all kinds of difficult things may be happening to us. All kinds of disadvantages. Maybe we're not as nice as, we don't, we wish we looked nicer, or we had more advantages, or we had more money, or better jobs. But in all the mess and difficulty and disappointments, can we see, can we also see the signs of God's kindness to us? You know, we look at the horizon of our lives, we just see all the bad stuff sometimes, don't we? Look out for God's kindness at work in your life. Stop today. Perhaps stop today. Take some time to think. Maybe after the service. Maybe as we finish the service. Can I just identify some of the ways God is, I, is blessing me? Okay, there's all of these things that are not as, like I would want them to be. But yes, the Lord is showing me kindness. And the Lord's love, of course, is is wonderfully different, isn't it? It doesn't have to be earned or deserved. It just has to be received. You can sort of sit back and receive. Just receive and recognize his love. It's a gift, isn't it? And maybe you can say what, you can then say what Leah said. This time I will praise the Lord. This morning I will praise the Lord. I know all of these things are going wrong in my life. But yes, I will praise the Lord because I do see his kindness to me and he's working all things together for my good. And then finally, through, through all this mess and stress and sadness and disappointment, Judah came. Levi came. He was the sort of uh, beginning of the, 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 the priests, if you like. The priests came from Levi and Judah came. And who came through Judah? Jesus came through the tribe of Judah. How wonderful. What a great reason for praise. Leah didn't know it, of course, but Jesus will eventually come, and we're the lucky ones, aren't we? Jesus has come. He has come. He's with us by his Spirit. He's begun that great work of salvation. He'll come again to finish what he started. One day Jesus will come to sort out all the mess. Even today he's working for the good of those who love him through the mess, through the disappointments. Through the sin, through the shame. God can use us. He can work through the most unpromising people like Leah and Jacob and Rachel. He can use us to do good. We know that in all things, God works for the good. And the greatest good is Jesus. I was speaking to one of Andy's aunts yesterday at the party. She works at Buckingham Palace. She works in the correspondence department. She says that they get lots of letters. uh, People writing to the king before the queen. Um, A lot of them are Christian letters. They they come with um, a sort of a Christian tone and agenda. They give thanks for the queen's faith in Jesus, as it was. They quote the Bible and so on. And it just reminded me that whatever, whatever position in life, whether royalty or, or commoner, or what, whoever we, we might be, I know we're all commoners here, um, we need Jesus. Even the royals need Jesus. The king needs Jesus. He needs the king of kings. Without Jesus, we are lost. 
Without Jesus, we have no hope, ultimately. No ultimate hope. But with him, with Jesus, and through him, and in him, we have all hope. We have life. We have salvation. We have all grace, grace upon grace. More than all in him I find, as one of our hymns says. Jesus. Do you have Jesus? Here in, in this sad, sad story, this ugly soap opera of a story, this mess of a story, emerges Judah. Judah was a, Judah was a piece of work, actually. Uh, he was the one who wanted Joseph to die later on in the story. But he changes. But he becomes the, the tribe from which Jesus appears and is born the Savior of the world. What hope there is in all the mess and stress. Don't worry too much about it. It's meant to be there. The disappointments are meant to happen. God is working in all these things for the good of those who love him. Look at the people in your life. Look at the stress and the mess around you and the difficulties that you face and think to yourself, what is the Lord trying to teach me here? He was trying to teach Jacob a lesson, wasn't he? What is he trying to teach us? Let's look at that. Because in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this truth, for this confidence we have. We know that in all things, you are working for the good of those who love you. You want to make us like Jesus. You want to save us for eternity. You want to bring us one day to glory through all the difficulties and disappointments through all the mess and stress that we will encounter along the way, you are working for our everlasting good. Thank you for this. Help us to know it in our hearts. Help us today to stop, to pause, to look uh, carefully for the, the blessings in our lives, the ways that you are doing us good, but also even to see in the bad things that are happening, how you may be teaching us lessons, how you may be showing us things about ourselves, and helping us to grow and to become more and more like Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray in his name. Amen.